Look at this sorry, miserable, squashed thing. They say all good things must come to an end. Mm. And when it comes to cheeseburgers, the pain Ouch. is real. Here are 10 once popular burger chains that sadly died. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? Cheeseburger in paradise. Ah, oh, what? Give us back our burgers! With the recent passing of singer-songwriter Jimmy Buffett, fans fondly remembered the man for more than just his music. He defined a lifestyle. Buffett expanded that brand and first got into food service with a chain of restaurants named after his song Margaritaville. And despite its nearly 40 years of success with 30 locations across the country today, it seems a burger chain was needed to pair with all those margaritas. So Buffett licensed the title of his song, Cheeseburger in Paradise, which led to the new chain opening in Indianapolis, Indiana in August of 2002. Separate from the Margaritaville chain, Cheeseburger in Paradise locations had Outback Steakhouse management oversee the franchising of each restaurant. Business seemed to be booming, with an eventual peak of 38 locations in 17 different states by the end of 2006. Not bad. Locations featured an island-themed atmosphere with tropical drinks and palm tree decor to invoke the paradise side of its name. But it also wasn't shy about the other half of its name. The stores lived up to it by specializing in burgers, with a menu offering 13 different burgers and options to substitute beef for turkey, chicken, or veggie patties. They also branched out with sandwich options, including a seafood sandwich that was self-proclaimed as being semi-world famous. But being famous wasn't good enough, and business dwindled to 23 locations by 2012, and the remaining locations were eventually bought and sold off. The final cheeseburger in paradise shut its doors in New Jersey in September of 2020. <laughs> Gonna cry? D's Drive-In. This tastes as delicious as Beyonce smells. Here's another regional restaurant that contributed to the bigger picture, thanks to a little clowning around. Dee's Drive-In was based in Utah and founded by Dee Frederick Anderson, who was an employee of a local burger shop at the University of Utah, before branching out with his own business in 1932. Dee's target demographic was hungry college students, and it worked to perfection, as his first shop saw upwards of 2,500 customers every day. Aside from burgers, the menu featured classic fare that we see across burger joints today, like hot dogs, french fries, sodas, and apple turnovers. I see you got my apple turnovers. They're delicious. Bro. Yeah. The chain was soon popular enough to have expanded to 53 locations in the three decades since opening at the university, but wound up being bought out by Hardee's in the 1970s. But more than the food, Dee's Drive-In has endured through urban legend due to its unique advertising style. Long before a clown like Ronald McDonald ever hawked a hamburger from McDonald's, and before Stephen King made everyone afraid of clowns, Dee's Drive-In got people's attention by featuring clowns on all their signage. Zingo! Brightly colored, mechanically animated, and full of flashing neon, a large balloon-wielding clown danced on top of every restaurant sign, beckoning folks to stop in for a burger. Whether or not the advertising worked or was just plain weird, in the end, we'd say the unfortunate demise of Dee's Drive-In is no <laughs> laughing matter. You're <laughs> laughing. You're laughing. Wimpy. Still alive! <laughs> the unique name of this burger joint capitalized on the popularity of Popeye the Sailor comic strips from the 1930s, specifically the character J. Wellington Wimpy and his popular catchphrase, I'd gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. <laughs> it's another vanished burger franchise to be founded in Indiana, opening the first Wimpy in Bloomington in 1934. The chain expanded faster than Popeye eats Kansas spinach, having spread to 25 locations by 1947, and in 1954, inking a deal for the rights to be used in restaurants across Europe. Wimpy remains a hit overseas even today, but stateside had quickly dwindled significantly and had only seven restaurants left by 1977. The original owner passed away a year later, and since nobody picked up the Wimpy franchise trademark, the restaurant chain met its end shortly after its founder. Wimpy the burger chain quietly faded into the background. <laughs> First time here? Well, we would arm wrestle Popeye for you to hit that subscribe button, so go ahead and smash it. Thanks. Little Tavern. One burger with four slices. Sorry, we can't.
can't do that. If imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then the Little Tavern shop chain was extremely flattering. Little Tavern was largely inspired by the success of the then-recently open White Castle Empire that started in 1921, six years before the first Little Tavern location in Kentucky in 1927. Founder Harry Duncan took cues from White Castle's unique and instantly identifiable restaurant construction that caught the eye of anyone passing by and came up with tall, green, triangular roofs that stood out to make his stores recognizable, too. And much like White Castle sliders, Duncan also preferred the idea of several smaller burgers to a single large one by selling his onion-infused mini-burgers at a bag of 20 for a dollar. I want 30 sliders, five french fries, and four large cherry cokes. And to push that idea, Little Tavern used the slogan, Buy em by the Bag, which was laughably similar to White Castle's original tagline of Buy em by the Sack. The chain was sold in 1981, and Duncan passed away in 1992, before the chain collapsed in his absence and closed in 2008. It goes to show that even if it's flattering, being just close enough usually isn't good enough. You will never be enough. Official All-Star Cafe They'll be craving these burgers, itching to get their fix! Game on! This sports-themed sit-down restaurant was here and gone quicker than a big league fastball, but definitely left its mark on burger fans. <laughs> Owned by the same company that brought the movie-themed Planet Hollywood chain to prominence in the 1990s, Official All-Star Cafe pivoted away from a trip to the movies in favor of courtside seats. With autographed memorabilia and uniforms from athletes adorning the walls, the restaurant had endorsements with, and even investments from, major pro athletes of its time. Baseball great Ken Griffey Jr., football star Joe Montana, and basketball icon Shaquille O'Neal were just some of the faces plastered on advertising to draw in hungry sports fans. The menu listed everything under a sports theme, too, with desserts as the home stretch and entrees as the main event. But the menu section that made this franchise an all-star team was the bullpen, which featured six different burger styles and was marketed as a favorite of professional golfer Tiger Woods. Turkey and veggie substitution options were available, but the popular sellers were the big, beefy patties, featuring a whopping half pound of USDA choice chuck beef on a toasted roll that was always served medium well. Variations included mushroom, onion and Swiss, chili and cheddar, or the bacon cheddar and barbecue western burger. But much like the athletes associated with it, the time eventually comes for retirement. And after opening its first location in 1995, official all-star cafe officially had its jersey raised to the rafters in the fall of 2007. We had a good thing, you stupid son of a- Burger Chef. That look like spit to you? Yeah. Like Cheeseburger in Paradise, Burger Chef also had its first location in Indianapolis when it opened for business in 1958. Just over a decade later, they'd expanded to a thousand restaurants in 1969 and peaked at 1,200 locations by 1972, which was closing in on the total number of nationwide McDonald's locations at the time. And even though they never caught up to Mickey D's, they had them beat to the punch with a marketing gimmick they called the Fun Meal. It was the first fast food chain combo specifically targeted to kids that included a toy and debuted in 1973, a full six years before McDonald's introduced the Happy Meal. Can I get a kid's meal? I don't see no kids. Burger Chef was also the first fast food chain to pioneer the now common concept of a meal for adults, too. They marketed adding fries and a drink to your burger under the original name of the Triple Threat Meal, and it sold for just 45 cents, long before anybody else had meals, deals, boxes, or combos on the menu. And while Burger King was telling us to have it your way, Burger Chef let the customers do it themselves by introducing a topping bar where you could add extras to your burger free of charge. Despite their innovations that remain commonplace today, the juggernauts at the top of the fast food industry had too much momentum, and Burger Chef was bought out by Hardee's in 1982. Still, we have to tip our hats to the franchise with the chef's hat for bringing so much to the table in its short time bringing burgers to the people. You know how much I sacrifice? Milligan's Beefy Burgers It's a hamburger on a bun with nothing.
While the burger business has expanded to become a global phenomenon, some franchises at the regional level left their mark on fast food, too. In this case, we pay our respects to a southern shop that officially introduced Florida to fast food. Plenty of burger chains started to take off in the decades following World War II, with McDonald's in the 1940s, Burger King getting going in the 50s, and Wendy's starting in 1969. But Milligan's Beefy Burgers was also there from the start with their debut in 1942. The Sunshine State's first ever fast food and drive through was a Milligan's that opened in the Florida city of Stark. In their first year of business, Milligan's Beefy Burgers boomed to the tune of 450,000 burgers sold in the first year alone. Just six years later, the pair brought their beef to the big city lights of Jacksonville. And by the middle of the 1960s, Milligan's Beefy Burgers had 16 stores across the state. And by that point, the whole operation was moving 5 million burgers a year to tourists and locals alike, buoyed by a promotion of selling a bag of a dozen burgers for just one dollar. But the fast Florida charm was eventually no match for the fast food influx of McDonald's and Burger King locations, and Milligan's Beefy Burgers bowed out in 1974. Carols. You would like to buy a M burger. Do you believe in reincarnation? Because the death of this specific burger chain eventually morphed into a bigger and better seller than its predecessor. Carol's was first established in 1960 with the classic dine-in slash drive-in model that was so common during the fast food boom. Like most of its competitors with their billions served and similar signage touting the popularity of their burgers, Carol's slogan was a serving a second, peaking with somewhere around 150 restaurants and touting themselves as a coast-to-coast -coast chain, they were particularly dominant in New York State, but had locations as far west as Wisconsin. By 1975, Carol saw the momentum of the national chains coming and ditched their branding in favor of entering a franchise agreement with Burger King, eventually converting every location to a BK outlet over the following few years. Today, they've become the nation's largest Burger King franchisee, and even sling a few chicken burgers as owners of some Popeyes locations, owning and operating over a thousand yeah. restaurants under the two brands. You know what they say, if you can't beat them, join them. You lose! Henry's Hamburgers. I hear they got some tasty burgers. We all love the feeling of a cool malt or milkshake after wolfing down a hot hamburger, but in the case of this defunct burger baron, it was actually the dessert that came first. Henry's Hamburgers was an extension of the Bresler Ice Cream Company, which was looking for new places to sell their supply of malts, shakes, and ice cream. And the fit with a fast food stand was a no-brainer. The first Henry's opened in Chicago, and only two years later had 35 spots across Illinois. A 10 burgers for a buck promotion and catchy slogan telling customers to head for Henry's kept the flow of customers steady. And by the time the 60s rolled around, they were up to over 200 locations across the Midwest. But by the mid-70s, Henry's met the fate of many other chains, facing ownership turnover and repeated survival mergers in the face of national chains taking over that eventually put them belly up. Wow. Indeed. White Tower. This might be the best hamburger I've ever had in my life. In the face of elimination, some extinct burger chains sold out to the big boys, and some decided they'd sell out and join them if they couldn't beat them. But some places decided that if they couldn't beat them, they'd just try to be them. While Little Tavern was more of a nod to White Castle, the chain White Tower didn't try to hide its copycat nature. Founded in 1926, White Tower's name and building design stole directly from White Castle, incorporating shock white interiors and exteriors, as well as a castle-like brick facade. If you're craving White Castle, the burgers here just don't cut it. It was similar enough to prompt a lawsuit from White Castle, which forced White Tower to revamp its aesthetics to a more Art Deco design. It was even proved in court that White Tower had gone as far as to photograph White Castle locations to keep up with their look. White Tower survived into the 21st century, but maybe having to come up with original ideas finally put this ripoff down for the count. I give up. Order up more great videos. Just tap or click and hit that subscribe button and ring that bell to join our notification squad.